You are listening to the cycling podcast Femina, supported by Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Hello, my name's Richard Moore. I'm with Orla Shinoui. Hello, Richard. Why, why the hesitation, Orla? Because you sounded like you were going to say something else. You no. looked at me funny. Orla Shinoui. And today we are joined by a special guest, national treasure, Stephen Fry. Good morning, Richard. Good morning, <laughs> When Orla, Orla told me that Stephen Fry was joining us, I, I must admit, I, you, you, you look different in the flesh. You're disappointed. You look disappointed. No, I'm only joking. It's Steve Fry, uh, not to be confused with Stephen Fry. Uh, listeners outside the UK might be totally bemused at this point. Steve Fry is a co-owner of sports marketing and management agency M2 Sports. Welcome, Steve. Thank you very much, Richard. Can I just say, Richard, you told Steve that you're going to introduce him with a little joke. <laughs> and that none of us joke. laughed at that. And I put money on it being original. And I think I've lost my money there. <laughs> <coughs> Has anybody ever cracked that joke before? Never, never, never <laughs> Richard. No, it's the first time I've heard it. You really are quite unique. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, thanks for joining us, Steve. You've got uh, an interesting perspective on... Uh, women's cycling and you got in touch with us actually I mean we know we know you anyway but you got in touch with us after the February episode where we had an interview with Tracy Godry about the women's world tour and you had some thoughts about that and and we thought they were quite interesting so here you are thanks very much thanks absolutely and it's M2 Sports which is the the, the agency that that I call early, early plug there <laughs> uh there's, there will be, there'll be plenty, don't worry. <laughs> we obviously do quite a lot of work in, in cycling, and, but especially women's cycling is something we're actually very, very passionate about and, and want to see if there's a way in which we can make a difference. We are speaking in mid-March. There have been two Women's World Tour events so far. Both have been good and, and lots of talking points. We'll talk about them in a moment. We'll hear in part one from Anna van der Breggen, the Olympic champion. Um, who has made a, a slowish start to the year, but we expect to see her in around the Ardennes Classics. And there's obviously a Liege Bass on the edge this year, as well as uh, Flesh Wallone, which she's won, I think, twice before. Um, and uh, in part two, as I say, we'll talk a bit about the Women's World Tour and, and discuss some of S- Steve's ideas. Part three, we're, we're uh, doing a little bit of a family special, aren't we, Orla? Um, yeah, we are. We've been collecting interviews with women riders who are part of cycling dynasties, I suppose, because there's quite a lot of them. So we'll hear from the Backsteads, Maggie. Mrs. Backstead. Maggie Backstead (laughs) and her daughter, (laughs) Eleanor. Uh, We'll hear from, uh, well, who else will we hear from? Abby Mae Parkinson you spoke to. Yeah, Abby Mae Parkinson, the daughter of Lisa Brambani, uh, four-time national champion in her day. And I didn't realise until I um, was doing my research for Abby Mae, actually retired at the age of 23. Um, wow. given uh, her Palmaris. Wow. Yeah, she retired very young. Um, so it's really interesting chatting to Abby May about um, her mum. Her dad was a sprint cyclist as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, I had a fun chat with her. I remember Lisa Brambani when I got into cycling. Oh, I know, don't, Richard. Don't, I'm going oh, red is, is for you. There's a story to tell here, Richard. <laughs> oh, come on. This is really unfair. <laughs> <laughs> you brought it up. Oh. I think Richard maybe, maybe had a poster or three no. of Lisa on his wall. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. I just said she was quite uh, a striking, uh, striking cyclist back in the used. day. She was she was a very um, attractive cyclist back in the day. And you mean I, her I, style? I can't obviously. believe she retired so young. <laughs> Moving on, we'll also hear from the Drutz sisters. I'm not. Am I saying that right? Drutz. I don't know. Drutz. You, you I did listen to them. Did sing it. Don't we on I didn't. Drutz, 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 Drutz. I didn't. I didn't speak to them. Hannah Troop oh. spoke to them. Four sisters all ride for the Sport of Landren team in Belgium, and uh, Hannah Troop caught up with them. That, that's a fun interview. Uh, they bounce off each other quite a lot, and uh, they've, they've a couple of them anyway have started the season pretty well. So look out for them, uh, and we'll hear from them in the final part. But as I said, we'll talk about racing in part one, and uh, my blushes are fading <laughs> a little bit now sufficiently <laughs> that we can move on. It's dark in here. You're lucky. <laughs> And you can't see it in the podcast, you're yeah, all right. No, um, so listen, Strada Bianchi was the first one. I watched it on uh, my Eurosport player on my phone without commentary. I like, I quite like watching races without commentary, but it would have been better if it had commentary and it had been on t- 
TV. It was on television in some places, and Longo Borghini spoke about af that afterwards. She was the winner, and it all came down to the, the final climb into Siena, a very steep climb, wet as well, so there was a lot of slipping wheels and so on. Longo Borghini, we remember her from the Olympic road race last year, where she was the, the driving force in that escape. She's always very willing, it seems, to lay it on the line. She's, she's aggressive. I remember you know, one of the early podcast we did last year from the women's tour there was a stage this hilly stage that went through matlock into chesterfield wasn't it finished the, the really decisive stage longo borghini was in the in the move there with ashley Mulman and, and lizzie armistead as she was then and her team wiggle high five weren't weren't very happy about her being there because they didn't mm -hmm. feel she had the best chance of winning and were keen for her not to work she was very much of the opposite opinion i spoke to rochelle gilmore and Longo Borghini after the stage and they had very different views about what the correct tactic was there but Longo Borghini's view was if she's in the break she's not going to sit on her her whole uh, that that would have gone against everything that she kind of stands for when it comes to racing she's always very willing to lay it on the line she says that after the Olympic road race she's even more willing to to be aggressive and to really race hard and Strada Bianchi is the sort of race where that attitude that approach can bring very positive results because it is a hard hard race and in the end the strongest rider often wins and and she was clearly the strongest still only 25 lisa longoborg and he's been around for quite a while but I, I don't know maybe she's the rider that who this year might emerge as as quite a dominant force i don't know what you think just to stay with strada bianchi a sec um it was just fantastic and if if anyone listening hasn't seen the end of it just google it the last um bit of the race around siena was about the best racing you can see longo borghini as you say very strong and starting the season very well the way she finished that was just textbook really because you could see that uh, nivia doma seemed to be as strong but it was all how Longo Borghini took those uh, corners and she didn't let up and you could see that Nivea Duma was, was maybe hesitating slightly so um, Longo Borghini also timed her win to the beat of uh, the Coldplay song that was playing at the time which I thought was just beautifully done um, obviously planned um, but yeah I thought it was just a brilliant race and also she had crashed quite heavily in the gravel section early in the race she had to borrow a teammate's bike she didn't get on her spare bike until after the gravel and got back on it again so that shows just how aggressively she was riding it um, the Bowles Dolmans girls really tried to work together to control the race it didn't work for Lizzie Dagnan this time finished third and she was complaining a little bit afterwards if complaining is not too strong a description that um, other teams weren't willing to work with them. And we've, we've talked a lot about Bowles Dolman's dominance over the past season or two. And this is maybe the first indicator, without being too preemptive, that that dominance has, you know, it's got its cracks because once a team becomes too uh, victorious, other teams don't want to work with them anymore, do they? And that can sometimes be the very thing that, that brings them down. But yeah, made for a really, really exciting race. Brilliant racing by Lucinda Brand as well. Unfortunate to have been overtaken in the in the final stretches, but brilliant race. You couldn't have wished for a better start to, to the Women's World Tour than that. Yeah, I mean, Shara Gillow and Lucinda Brand, both, they, they did exactly what we always want to see hmm. riders do when they bridge across to a group. Just just go straight past mm. them and, and, you know, catch them by surprise. They'd made a huge effort, obviously, to bridge that gap because those are th those were strong riders in the front. Longo Borghini, as you say, did the right thing. Didn't panic, knowing that the hill was coming up. You know, gambled that they were going to pay for that effort, and and they did. But it was it was a tremendous race to watch. And then a week later, we had the Ronde van Drent. Is that the correct pronunciation? I think it's, I think it's like with a soft e in the end. Drenthe. Drenthe. That's it. Um, no point asking me. To be honest. <laughs> and another pronunciation uh, challenge for me, Amelie de Derrickson who Diderikson, Diderikson. Diderikson, who we had on last month's podcast. The, the World Championship uh, was a huge surprise, although we, we know how talented she is, but to serve up such early confirmation that she's going to be, a, you know, I guess, a worthy world champion, that she's not going to suffer the so-called curse of the rainbow jersey. It, it, it suggested that as world champion, she's going to be better. And I thought that was just wonderful to see. I mean, she's such an unassuming rider. I, I think that will change with the number of wins that she'll hopefully get under her belt. She hasn't even well, had. You think half she'll become more arrogant? No, I think she'll just become more confident and more sure of herself. And, and kind of green. She, I mean, yeah, almost exactly. a, she's a very endearing sort of. Yeah. 
innocence about her, I thought, and, when you and did the she, interview. She's very endearing in the way that she doesn't seem to presume that she will have the leader's role in any race. And I would like to see that change. I would like her to be able to say, you know what, we've got an incredibly strong team, but I am worthy of, of being supported today. And that's probably what happened at Ronda Van Drenthe. Um, Lizzie Dignan didn't race that day. Maybe... Um, that's because they decided to get behind Diderikson. Um And she had said that she would be happy to be uh, to play the role of a domestic in the Rainbow Vans. Um, much nicer to see her winning, though. Yes, yeah, so it was a great, great and, and what, what a sprint. I mean, mm. you know, she was away in, in a group towards the end of the race. When she she pressed on the accelerator, she was uh, it was it was incredibly she won by by a few lengths. It was Cavendish esque. You know, mm. it was just an incredible uh, acceleration, so very impressive. And I think with Diderikson, possibly, is it now that she has had this win, and we're talking about how many wins she can get, she hasn't even had half a dozen wins at, at the professional level yet, because there are so many potential leaders in that team. Last year, when she got her a very late uh, first win of the season, her teammates were saying, well, you know, actually this is what she can do and we support her and we don't support her enough I think that's what's going to change this season we'll see her being given the race captaincy an awful lot more which could be very interesting mm -hmm. isn't it I mean because you know with so many established winners you've got strong personalities yeah. as well and, and one of them a new addition this year is Anna van der Breggen who left Rabo where she'd been for, for a few years uh, and moved over uh, to further bolster the Bulls Dolmans team. She's the Olympic champion, as I said, and one of the strongest riders in the world. And uh, Owen Rogers caught up with her recently at the Bulls Dolmans training camp. Here she is, Anna van der Breggen. A bit, of course, it was an important goal of the season of 2016, and it for me, I became Olympic champion. And of course, you got more busy after, and I got some uh, different things, which were also really nice, but make me busy. And and now uh, I'm starting a new season with a new team, and I think so far with that, there's not much change. Of course, you think about it many times, but I didn't really had the time just to stop and to. Yeah, for example, we just watched the road race, I think, uh, one month ago together with my boyfriend. And it was the first time I saw the road race. Mm -hmm. And I was really, uh, if you if you ride on a bike, you are so focused and you are in the race only focusing on what you have to do. And when I saw the race, it was really exciting because I didn't know the group behind us was so close behind us. And I didn't do many things. So if you see it back, it's, it's uh, yeah, it was Nice and also not nice to see, of course, the crash from Anamik was still scary. But after the finish, now I feel really happy because I know with Anamik it all goes well and, and I am really the Olympic champion. So I could see it now together with my boyfriend and it was a nice moment of reflection. I already was three years with Rabo and it, I had three great years. And for me also, uh, sometimes I like changing. I like changing um, people around me. I like I like it if there are new races. It for me it counts with everything. Yeah, I, I just like to ride the new races. Like the Amstel Gold race is important for the the cycling, especially for the women. So that's I want to be good there. If if they ride for me or not, that doesn't matter really. I haven't wear the world champion jersey yet. So yeah, of course it's a goal and and it's a different uh, a hard goal to win. I know that. But I will try. I will try every year and I came close already a couple of times, so that's really motivated me to to try it again, so I will. The Cycling Podcast Femina is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much indeed to Science and Sport for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast Femina. You can get 20% off all Science and Sport products at scienceandsport.com. If you enter the code TCP20 at the checkout, TCP20 at the checkout, it doesn't work in conjunction with other offers, but for most Science and Sport products, you can get 20% off, which is a fantastic bargain. And we're very grateful to Science and Sport for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast Femina and the Cycling Podcast. So we heard before the break there from Anna van der Breggen, the Olympic champion. I expect to see her come to the fore in the next few weeks, I guess, as the races become a bit hillier and harder. Interesting to hear her talking about the Olympic road race and having you know, watched it back recently for the first time, being struck, I suppose, by how exciting it was. And it's always, it's always interesting when you speak to riders who've been 
involved in really exciting races that they often are oblivious to that. And, and you know, at the time, I remember Annemiek van Vluten obviously had that horrendous crash and people were fearing for her life after it. And, you know, from that league group's perspective, uh, it was Emma Johansson, Elisa Longo-Borghini and Anna van der Breggen. They went past her in a crumpled heap, but they hadn't seen it happen and they didn't know how dramatic it had looked. It must have been fascinating for her to, to re-watch the race. I mean, Anna's an incredible rider and to, to hear her recall it in that, in that way is, is really interesting because I guess it's one of the uniquenesses of the Olympic road races, obviously no radios, and therefore, and, and on a course like that where inevitably it was just going to break up all over the place on the final ascent up that, up that climb. Um, they had no idea what was going on. They had no idea who, who was where. So sort of almost like makes the win even more formidable. It's like in, ra in, racing, in way. racing in the dark, to paraphrase David Miller's book, but nothing to do <laughs> with that at all. But, you know, I think this is the thing that when you're watching it on TV, you've got this perspective on it where you can see the different groups. You can see who's working. You can see whether the, there's a chase organized or not. You know, when, when right, and when sometimes when you're in a team car and there isn't great, because even when there are radios, there's often not very good you know, information coming through about who is where and who's doing what. It's one of the underrated skills of bike racing, just that instinct that, you know, to know, you know, when, and I mentioned earlier, Longo Borghini was absolutely key in ensuring that group stayed clear. And that was just a sort of racing instinct, I suppose. And interestingly, that's even more prevalent in the women's peloton than it is in the, the men's peloton. Obviously, we have radios pretty much across all men's racing now. It used to be just limited to the, the world tour, but but now pretty much goes a, across every single race. Within, within women's racing, radios are a really new initiative. I mean, literally probably last season was the first time they were they were prevalent and, and used in the in the women's world tour races so it's it's interesting to compare women's racing versus men's racing for that reason like you do see more instinctive racing i think within the women's peloton and that might be one of the reasons because they've had to do it all their lives and i'd actually love to see radio stay out of women's racing i mean a few years ago you remember men's racing they talked about um taking radios away from the races it never really happened there were pros and cons. I think once it's been established in the peloton, it's very difficult to undo it. Um, and I think that is what makes women's racing so lovely and so dynamic and so exciting to watch. I think it'd be a shame if we were to bring any element of control into it whenever that's maybe the USP that women's cycling actually has. I mean, the only, the only thing I'd say to that, and, and very much with sort of like my rider's hat on, is the, 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 the safety aspect of, of radios is really, really important. To use the Olympic. Uh, road race as a case in point from the men's race the woman knew that that uh, corner was dangerous we saw crashes in that exact same point Garant Thomas um, suffered a nasty crash and his shot at glory was over Vincenzo there Vincenzo Nibali Vincenzo Nibali as well Chris Froome I understand actually crashed on the same corner uh, on one of the earlier loops as well that uh, wasn't really caught on camera so they knew it was coming uh, when I spoke to Anamik after the, uh, she'd recovered and come out of hospital, she said, I knew that it was dangerous and that's just part of bike racing. So I'm not sure that radios would have made a difference there. But I understand that that is the argument for it. But already this year, we're seeing, I mentioned the, the inconsistent TV coverage of, of Strada Bianchi and there's a, a, a situation with the Tour of Flanders coming up. We, had, we could see that live last year. And um, while the men's race was on, we were able to watch the finish of the women's race. That, that is in the balance this year, I think, isn't it? The TV coverage of the, the Women's Tour of Flanders? When you create something new within, within sport, you have, you have a moment in time to get everything right. Yeah, and that's at the start. And I fe always felt that the Women's World Tour was maybe rushed in a little bit. Yes, we'd ha we had the World Cup, but I felt that because we had new leadership at the UCI, and women's cycling was put sort of front and center of that manifesto, that there was a need to do something quickly rather than do it right. And, and that's why the Women's World Tour appeared very, very quickly. In my opinion, as, as virtually a rebadging exercise of, the, of what was previously the World Cup with the addition of a, a few additional races. But those races weren't, weren't there because the World Tour had been created. Those races were there because innovative race organizers from around the world had seen the opportunity with them in women's cycling and decided that they, they, that they wanted to, to, to put them on. So I would have liked to have seen a more strategic thought put into 
the launch of the women, Women's World Tour because as I say, you get this, this one moment in time to, to, to get it right. And for me, I would have liked to have seen something that was actually had a better narrative built around potentially the UCI maybe retaining some of the rights to, to the Women's World Tour in terms of the commercial rights um, so that they could go off and, 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 and sell those and potentially bring in world wide brands which would bring kudos uh, to the event like we see in the Women's Tennis Association like we see in the L LPGA Tour as, as two real sort of benchmark women's sporting uh, events and I would also like to have seen a really clear set of guarantees put in place to the race organisers in terms of what you have to do to become a world tour event because it's been very inconsistent in terms of what each, each event has done. You, so I have the privilege of going to a number of these races and I guess there's a very wide disparity in quality of infrastructure. There's a very wide disparity in the quality of media coverage and a very wide disparity in terms of TV coverage especially. I mean, just on that, Steve, I've seen a couple of women's races this year that, which have been live streamed. Are you suggesting that they don't need broadcasters, that they can cut out the, the broadcasters and, 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 and broad, take ownership of the broadcasting themselves? I think we have to be a little careful in terms of uh, in terms of saying live streaming is the answer it's better well than, no because yeah it's better than, than nothing but the quality isn't there but is, is there a, a middle way then between a race being shown on on Eurosport or another very established channel and 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 perhaps you know as you say showing it on YouTube or something well I think you should you should be looking at both so uh, I want to see high quality TV production we know that TV broadcasters want to broadcast women cycling um, there's been plenty of appetite for it. They're not prepared to pay for it, which is disappointing, but that's understandable at the moment based on the fact that we haven't built the audience to the scale and level that we need to, so it's the broadcasters will, will pay, for the, pay for the content. So what we need to get to is a position where, at the moment, the onus in terms of TV coverage is all put on the race organiser. So the women's tour is, is, is a great example. Yeah, they pay for the TV production... Yeah, through an independent TV production company to produce those five one-hour highlights episodes throughout, throughout the women's tour and then do a separate deal with ITV4 for them to broadcast. ITV4 are happy to broadcast. The audiences are, are, are fantastic, but not quite big enough for them to sort of warrant dipping their hand in their pocket and saying, yes, we'll, we'll pay for the production. That's a huge onus on a, on, on a race organiser. On top of all the other costs that they have, putting on pro bike races isn't cheap. And for, for the onus to be on them to do it, I think is wrong. And this is where I think the UCI could, 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 could have helped as well. Because the UCI, yeah, if they're serious about the growth of women cycling, and um, I think we're all agreed that getting this sport out there and visible is probably the single biggest thing we have to do for it to continue to grow then why weren't the UCI using their very significant cash reserves that they have to actually part fund that? Why aren't they going to the organisers and saying, I'll tell you what, yeah, we'll contribute a percentage of TV production on the basis that you then guarantee that it happens? If only we knew someone who worked in TV. <laughs> well... The TV point is a very important one because you mentioned the women's tour and how well organised it is and they have put together this package and ITV4 are broadcasting it but even they say they cannot get TV interest. So you say that TV channels want to broadcast women's cycling. That's not their experience. They can't get European channels to come on board and, and they say that they've been trying year on year. I mean, that to me then, I don't know, that there are bigger problems at play. But I wanted to play devil's advocate as well on a few things that we were talking about, Steve, before we started recording. I mean, I, I agree with you. I think that uh, they rushed into this. I think that something did have to be done, though, and, and momentum had to be continued from Brian Cookson coming in on a ticket of, partly at least, of, of promoting women's cycling. And I think that the, that the narrative provided by the, the Women's World Tour is actually quite a good narrative from an outsider's point of view. So for me, watching at home, following on Twitter, following the races however I can, albeit in a limited way, uh, I do think that it's much better than the old World Cup system. We've got more racing. We've got more days of racing. It's not just one-day races. And there's more, there's more consistency with the men's calendar, which I think really helps to tap into the market that's there already. 
when you talk about how much better organized it could have been and should have been in comparisons with tennis and golf, the men's side of those sports are also much, much, much better organized than men's cycling. I think the problem with the organization of bike racing from the very top is not just a women's specific one, although the, the women's problems are probably exacerbated mm. from coming from a much worse position. But when, when you're looking at television rights and, and race rights and, and who owns what in terms of you know that, that whole marketing pie, that's quite messy on the men's side as well. And I, I, isn't, that, is, isn't this the point though, Orla? <laughs> There was there, there's a point in time here where we can actually change that model a little bit. So we don't have to replicate the way that the sport is organized for the men, for, for the women, because there's, I guess there's, there's less stakeholders uh, in, in, involved and there's, there's the opportunity therefore actually for the governing body to take a higher degree of control, which is in effect what the UCI wrestle with, with the, with the men's tour. At the moment, all the control on the men's side of the sport sits with the probably two or three race organizers and the UCI had the opportunity here to actually get a bit of control of the women's sport and just pretty much gave it all away so you can see now the women's side of the sport actually going down exactly the same road yeah. that the men's sport has gone and, and do we really want to be in that situation it I is think we do it is compared to the men's world to a very streamlined calendar mm. without clashes and so on you know there, well, there are still clashes, but the World it, Tour overtakes any of the other races that have been. Yeah, you know, oh yeah, there are clashes, that but have had yeah, to be yeah, of course. But you know, the, the World Tour is, is, mm -hmm. is a is yeah, a thing yeah. that you know all the top top riders can ride all the races if they want to, and you know, the, the, so the leader's jersey can be there in, in every in every race potentially. The the things that 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 cause problems and and present hurdles for the UCI and men's cycling are those major race organisers that you mentioned, ASO and R RCS. They 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 make token efforts to promote women's racing, but they don't they don't really recognise the opportunity that it, that it that it represents at all. Which I think there are two arguments. One is you could say that they have a responsibility to put on women's racing, and that's what La Course feels like. It feels like a, a box ticking exercise. But that's a, it's a weak argument to, to make to say you you should do it because you just should. A far stronger argument to make is you should do it because there's a huge opportunity here, and it would be good for business to to grow. There's a huge opportunity to grow this market. Is there an, is there the opportunity for somebody, an organisation, or you know somebody to come in and, and basically take take ownership of the the women's world tour? And that would obviously require the investment that would would lead to better TV coverage and so on. Can you could you see that happening? Can you see the UCI being willing to to, to hand over ownership of it to a, a third party? I think the problem there, Richard, is what we're talking about is what do the UCI actually own to hand over? Bar a badge called the UCI Women's World Tour. The the in effect, the Women's World Tour is owned in the same way as the Men's World Tour. It's owned by the race organisers already, mm. um, and I think we'll continue to to see that evolve. I agree with you in terms of the, where the sport potentially develops is, is, is interesting. I think we, I get quite frustrated when I hear lots of calls, sometimes from riders, sometimes from teams, sometimes from the media in terms of saying we have to have a women's tour de France. I do not see that as the, the, the answer to women, women cycling's uh, problems because the tour is the tour. And... Uh, you will never ever be able to compete against the men's tour, men's tour de France just based on how huge it is and how it engulfs the whole men's calendar, let alone trying to put a women's event alongside it. Let's go and develop the women's side of the sport in the countries that we know are actually passionate about it and there is a market out there to want to, to watch it and see it. Where do I see that? I see that being Britain, obviously. I think we've got a great market here. We get 1.7 million people watch the women's tour over the, over the five days. So that tells you that people want to see standalone women's racing. I think Australia is ripe, ripe for development. I think Scandinavia um, is definitely ripe for development. And obviously having Amelie as world champion at the moment can, can only help that. Uh, Germany uh, would be another market that I think would be very, very open to the development of women's cycling. And we maybe need to look away from France, Belgium, Spain, maybe even Italy, although it's sort of Italy probably 
uh, th th there are certain parts of Italy that are, are really passionate about the women's side of the sport and we wouldn't want to lose that. You are listening to the cycling podcast Femina, supported by Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Thank you very much indeed to our main sponsor, Rafa, for sponsoring the cycling podcast, Femina. Thank you in very much indeed to them. Shall we move on to families? Um, I think I've said enough. Probably <laughs> more. We'll get you back on at some point, Steve. Orla, you were going to sing sing us in for this? We oh, are no, no. family. <laughs> uh, I well, got all my sisters with me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Stunned silence. <laughs> Steve's got his Steve's head actually, in his hand. <laughs> He's head butting his own hand. Sorry. Oh dear. Sorry. Anyway, um, well, no, we talked about I this need, for a I while. I thought we needed to lighten the mood. We've been a little bit... It's um, a bit serious, yeah. Yeah, it's a bit serious. Well, let's lighten the mood immediately by yes. hearing from the fantastic Drutz sisters. <laughs> the Drutz, the Drutz sisters. <laughs> Drutz, 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 Drutz. The Droits, the Droits, the Droit sisters, yeah. Kelly, Jesse, Yessi, Demi, and Lenny. <laughs> what, what, have I, what have I said now? <laughs> what have I said now? What have I, what I, have I, laugh. What have I got wrong? What have I got wrong now, Steve? You've got nothing wrong, Richard. Um, well, anyway, the four of them, uh, and they all race for the same team, Sport of Landron. Uh, Hannah Troop spoke to them. It was it was a fun interview. Let's hear it now. Uh, hi, I'm Kelly Dreitz, I'm 26 years old and I'm living in uh, Wilrek in Belgium. I'm Lenny Dreitz, I'm 19 years old. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and I live in Wilrek. Um, I'm Jesse Dreitz, I'm 22 years old. Um, I'm the mother of a son, Louis. He's one year and a half and I'm also from Wilrek. Lenny and I live together with our parents and Jesse and Kelly live with our boyfriends. <laughs> okay, perfect. And so do you go out and train quite a lot together then? We try to go uh, ride together and um, we will see it's possible because she has to go to school and she also, Lenny and Demi. And uh, Jesse is also sometimes uh, far away from uh, Antwerp because her boyfriend lives uh, out of the city. When we are racing together, we try to do uh, our uh, training together. But when the races are more separate, it's difficult to train together. But when, when we are uh, all in Belgium and all at the same place, we all, all, always train, train together. Do you think that that kind of gives you a bit of a, a benefit that helps keep you motivated? When we train together and we, you have to do a sprint, it's always nicer to do it uh, next to the other girl. It's like a little competition yeah. in the training, so it's, really it's nice. better, better for us and better for each other. And also when one of the girls doesn't want to go to training or... As a bit tired. Yeah. tired. You have to say, come on, let's go together, and it's yeah. nicer. Who's the one who usually is like, I don't want to go training? <laughs> <laughs> it really oh, depends. Oh, well, everyone has it. Everyone Sometimes. has a day when it's more like, no, I don't feel like training today. And when it's rainy or yeah. it's dark outside. Your no problem, I will pick you up. And, yeah. Go. <laughs> yeah. and so do you think there is a, a quite a healthy competitiveness between you all? Not really com competition but really uh, to support each other and we that's, know that's what's really nice uh, each of us can do in the in the race so yeah we are four nice. different racers she is more a climbing sprinter she's a hard rider i'm a sprinter and she's also all rounder <laughs> yes <laughs> And so when you were growing up, were you, did you grow up in quite a cycling family? Or are you kind of the first mm. members of the family to get into um, cycling? Or an uncle raced, but we were, we were too young to realise it, so we didn't. We did first uh, gymnastics, then triathlon, duathlon, and then so we came... Uh, we follow a, a our brother. brother, our brother yeah. If you want to race, you want to be a cyclist, and mom and dad said, no, wait, and you have to do first other sports and do something different, and that's the reason we are doing duathlon and triathlon, and then we go over to cyclists. Why, was there a reason why they didn't want you to go into cycling for a start? Because cycling is obviously such a big sport in Belgium. It's not cycling, but they wanted us to do more than one sport. They wanted us to see uh, more than one thing. So they tried me, you have swimming, um, 
running and cycling, so you have three sports, and then uh, with cycling, it's, it's just uh, cycling, so that's why... You have a full this. body... Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, development. Development of our body. For that, That's why uh, they wanted us to do more than yeah. one sport. Are you all full-time cyclists, or do you have other jobs to, as well? They go to school. Yeah, obviously. Uh, she's a pro cyclist, and I am as well. She's going to be a teacher, so it's a uh, university. High school. High school, um, yeah. Yeah, no, it's not high school, it's uh, not university, but. Allez. Something yeah. between. It. Between. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I want to get my diploma and then try to be a cyclist, pro cyclist, and then after that I have my diploma and I can yeah. work as a teacher. So yeah. first cycling and then teaching. And so when you're actually in a race, so this is going to be the first race that you've all four of you raced together, but surely you've raced like one or two of you. Yeah. In a, and how do you find in the race, do you find that the bond that you have as siblings means that you can understand better in a race together? Yeah, we have How's to that work? look to each other to see, and we know already, yeah, that's, uh, what that's how she's feeling. Or yeah. That's how, uh, yeah. Yeah, you the body language is really, lot. we know it, we, we know it from each yes, other, so it's yeah. really, yeah. We have the same problem. When <laughs> 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 oh, we're like this, it's, it's hard, it's not hard. great, it's not good. No, we we have don't that. have to speak to it, to understand each other. Yeah. yeah. So that's also, when you're, when you're in a race then, if you ever see each other have like a crash or anything, that surely is uh, quite... It's, it's not, pre it's not uh, nice. Yeah. yeah. I look... We, I think every one of us does it. We look to see if it's one of our team, and when it's a sister, it's yeah, it's not. It's uh, are they okay? Yeah, or the, the feeling is the... it's not it's not good. Yes. But when they come back, or when you see they're yeah, it's okay. Then in your head you're okay, but um, it's not nice to see some of your team and especially a sister. It's not uh, yeah, something we like. So that was the Dretz sisters. Got there in the end. Uh, <laughs> they sound like they have fun. Oh, that was lovely to listen to. What, how refreshing. I mean, what a lovely way for a family to be, you know, just to be out riding every day, to be supporting each other, to ride in the same team. I thought that was really, really lovely. Can you imagine what it must be like for their mum and dad? And their brother, who's also a, a cyclist. Brother. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, be brilliant uh, for their mum and dad. Off you go, girls. Absolutely. See you at tea time. Yeah. Um, it's, it's been, I've been able to watch them a, a, a few times this year, actually, and... Uh, don't ask me which one. Uh, but one of them was very aggressive at Newsblad, actually. So, right, and Je uh, Jesse was fifth at Le Samin, the Didam, recently, which, you know, big race in Belgium. Kelly was second on stage four of the women's stage race down in Valencia as well. So she started the season well. She's, she's a former world champion on the track as well. And the youngest one, Lenny, who's 19, she was a Belgian uh, junior champion last year. Uh, sorry, two years ago on road and track. So they're... Decent, you know, good riders. Um, they've got a team pursuit team, haven't they? <laughs> yeah, Four of them. Yeah. They could compete, as a, do, compete yeah. as a family. That would be impressive, wouldn't it, to see that representing Belgium, Tokyo 2020, the Dretz sisters. <laughs> got it. <laughs> Make it happen. That'd be brilliant. Yeah, imagine the posters come from far and wide to watch the Dretz sisters. I, I know speaking to Hannah Barnes in particular as well, her sister Alice, and we should have mentioned her earlier, she rode outstandingly mm. well recently in the Ronde van Drent. Um, she's, yeah. she's very talented, but she, Hannah was saying when, when Alice was coming through and starting to compete in the same races, she was torn between, you know, looking out for her, but also being concerned mm -hmm. for her. And whenever she could hear a, a crash or anything happening, she'd be looking around, checking it was, wasn't her sister. And there's obviously that element too, that you're, you're, you're sort of maybe not as focused on your own race as you could be, especially for the older sibling, I think. Yeah, I'm sure that probably goes quite quickly, though, because I'm sure the younger ones prove themselves and learn their way fairly quickly. And the younger ones don't seem to care so much they, about they that. It's do. always, uh, yeah, it's always yeah. the, the older siblings who are more concerned for the yeah. younger one, I think. I think there's also that, that whole bit of about a bit of sibling rivalry that, that comes in as well that can actually be just a little bit of additional motivation. They just want to kick each other's butt, to be honest, <laughs> a, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of the time. Usually in sporting families, the younger, the younger one tends to end up better. I mean, the Schleck brothers being one example, but I can't think of many sporting families where the opposite has been... Oh, sorry, Miguel and Jain. <laughs> and his younger brother, Prudencio. That's a very clear example of the older brother being slightly better. Is Pe Uraj Sagan Uri is older than Peter Sagan. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. yeah. So there's another example. Orla's I'm working my her brains brain. now. Andy and Jamie Murray. Uh, Which one's older? Uh, uh, Jamie, <laughs> Jamie's older. 
Jamie's older, but I didn't know we were extending it beyond to other <laughs> sports. Sport. He doesn't sport. Yeah, no, sport. true. Okay, yeah, fair, fair enough. Um, fair yeah, enough. let's get back to the topic, though. Eh? Well, All right, sorry. You moved into <laughs> men's cycling, <laughs> yeah, so I thought let's just okay, take let, over let, Let's go on to our next, our next fancies. family. A family you probably know well, Steve, being uh, based in Wales as you are, um, because Maggie, Magnus, Backstead. Oh, my God. I can't believe That's what people say to me. You must know her. She's from Ireland. No, like, but I, hang on. Wales is quite a big country. Yeah, Wales is quite a big country, but the cycling community in Wales is is not huge. Um, Steve, do you yeah. know the Backsteads? I don't know them at all. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll reverse out of that cul-de-sac. Oh. Um, oh. But you're right, Richard. The, the South Wales cycling community is one very, very strong. Um, yeah. Um, and and everybody knows everybody, apart from the fact that I don't know They're the Backsteads. The backsteads. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, don't bother editing that out. We'll leave that in. <laughs> it's only fair. Well, let's hear from them. Magnus Backstead, former winner, of course, of Pyro Bay and a professional rider for many years. A Tour de France stage winner as well, wasn't he, at one point? And let's hear from him. His daughter is a promising young rider. Here they are, Magnus and Eleanor Backstead. Well, we are in central London, City Hall, where we've just had um, the announcement of the Women's Tour route for the year. And we've got Magnus Backstead and his daughter, Eleanor, both here. Thanks for joining us. And Richard. Glad to clear up the fact that Maggie <laughs> oh, and you, you is not this. a promising uh, a promising female rider. Maggie, you don't look like a promising female rider. No, I, I think I'm a bit ex now. Um, you know, there, there was a few years ago since I rode, but um, I'm definitely not a female one. Right, this has to be put into context here, Richard. I can't believe you've done this to me. Um, the wonderful Charlotte, who's sitting beside us, who, who set up for Magnus and Eleanor to come from Wales this morning, sent me a text message last night saying, I just wanted to check that we're still on for Maggie and Eleanor because they've got to get the tree in. Um, I've been working quite a lot recently, and so I'm a little bit tired, and I read the text message, and I replied and said... Um, yeah, that's great. I mean, I knew we were doing Eleanor, but I don't know who Maggie is. But if you think she's a good rider, I'm sure we'll find a spot for her in the podcast. And then sent a subsequent message to Richard saying, just to warn you, um, we've got Eleanor, but another lady, Maggie. I'm not sure who she is. I'm a bit embarrassed to ask, but I'm sure we'll find out tomorrow. To which, of course, Richard replied, <laughs> do you mean Magnus? The penny dropped. I felt like an absolute... Uh, well, I, I won't say the word, <laughs> expletive. And, uh, yeah, here we are. So welcome, Maggie. You're much more Thank masculine you. in person than I thought you might have been. <laughs> uh, Eleanor, uh, you, you come from a cycling family, obviously. Um, tell us how you started cycling and then racing. Uh, I started when I was quite little, just inspired like by Dad and um, racing. Did my first race when I was about four-ish and just loved it ever since, really. So you never had a choice, really, did you? No, but if I didn't like it, then I wouldn't do it. So how, how did you sort of progress from there? And, and, you know, as you got more into it, was there a particular discipline that, that you enjoyed more than others? Uh, I like all disciplines, really. My club when I was younger was mainly flyers, and that's mainly road and track, so I've kind of stuck to those with a bit of cycle cross sometimes in the winter just to get training up. Maggie, how do you um, obviously support and encourage without I guess putting pressure on because when you know your parents obviously uh, your wife as well have, have have a great pedigree in the sport how do you get that balance right? Well, it can be tricky at points obviously and uh, I certainly don't want to be a, a pushy parent I just want to facilitate whatever both Eleanor and, and her younger sister so we want, want to do if they want to keep in the sport and that's that's brilliant because you know it's something that both me and Meg, my wife, have uh, enjoyed through our careers. But at the same time, like Eleanor said, if if they don't want to do it, then then that's fine as well. It's not it's not a problem. So it's just finding that right balance to between life and and training and school and everything else around it, and uh, and just back them up with the, the decisions that they make. And sometimes it's it's the question of just putting down all the options in on the table in front of them and. They might not be able to see the options themselves at the time, but if you put them down on the table in front of them and, and they can pick and choose what they seem to be right for themselves. And you said to me earlier that what you really wanted for both your daughters was that they would get into a sport and get into it quite seriously because of the discipline it teaches you and all the um, lessons uh, as a growing human being, I guess. At what stage did you realise that Eleanor had uh, quite a talent at cycling? Um... I think it was relatively relatively early because 
you know, I've, I've watched bike riders since I was 12 years old myself, and there's certain riders that you look at and they just there's just something about them when they sit on the bike and when, when they ride. It's almost like it's more natural being on two wheels than on, on their feet. And I think both Eleanor and Zoe sort of fall under that category. But I don't think it was really until this last year now, 2016, where we really started to see the, 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 the big potential. And when Eleanor decided that she wanted to, to start training hard and, and she's come to me and said, Dad, what can we do to, um, to improve and to, to go faster? And you said that you don't want to be a pushy parent. I mean, who does? But at the same time, you, I guess it's fair to say maybe you've been frustrated by Eleanor having to be held back to a certain extent and you're trying to expand her racing a little bit. Isn't that right? Yeah, you know, it, we always want to, to sort of create the opportunities and create the ability to, to go and do and, and learn the, 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 the sport in, in full. Um, looking across in, into the European races and stuff like that um, the, the riders in, in this age category in the 15, 16 year old category are getting to do a lot more um, road racing, uh, open road races where there's longer circuits um, there's more opportunities to create and build a bike race for themselves so we're talking tactically you know, having the patience to wait and using the hills, using crosswinds, using everything else whereas as good as the closed circuit facilities are that we have in the UK, they have a tendency to, to lend themselves more to a slightly more negative form of racing because there isn't that opportunity to go for a longer hill or, you know, this is two, three kilometre dead straight road with crosswind on it where you can put it in, in the gutter and, and, and really sort of create something within the bike race. So I feel there's something that we need more of in, in the UK and um, you know if we can't then, then we've got to go, go abroad and, and start looking for that because I believe that they're being held back a bit. And one thing you're doing as well, Eleanor, is racing against the boys a little bit. That's the route that Emily Diderickson, the, the world champion, took as well. What difference do you find racing against boys on the continent compared to the girls' only races here? Uh, it's much harder and faster because they, they seem to attack more and almost make the race a little bit more exciting at points rather than leaving it to like a fast 10k at the end. They throughout the race will just constantly make it hard but it brings you on a lot because you have to be able to stay with them otherwise you don't end up going anywhere. You mentioned you've got great expertise in your family, obviously. I mean, your mum and your dad both race at a very high level. Um, how, what, what, what are their strengths in terms of the advice they can offer? Is it, is it training? Is it tactics? You know, do, do they have different bits of expertise that they can share with you? Yeah, they're both different advice they give me. Obviously, from women's racing, mum knows how that works. And she can give me advice about that, how late to leave here, when I can attack, all advice about the circuits, whereas Dad can give me better advice for, like, European races and how to make the racing hard, how to attack properly and at certain points. But they both just support me through school and schoolwork. Anything I really want to do, they're there to support me. Which is does your dad's coaching, does that involve showing you old videos of Harry <laughs> Ruby? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> so we heard there from uh, good friends of yours, Steve, the Backsteads, <laughs> Magnus and Eleanor. It must, must be nice to hearing them again. Small community in We all so know each a other. A story that you'll know well. Um, but, you know, we obviously know Magnus Backstead, who is a former former rider and uh, now regularly heard on Eurosport as a co-commentator as well and, and clearly very involved in his daughter's career. She's a huge talent and, and her mother was a, was a very good rider as well. Yeah, it seemed a bit of an inevitability that she would end up in cycling. Magnus said that... Well, she had to give it a go, didn't she? <laughs> yeah, well, you might as well if you're going to um, have a shot at anything and, and follow your gene pool. Um, but quite in contrast, really, to Abby Mae Parkinson I spoke to, she's just signed for drops this year. Um, she was with Cerveto Futon. Um, she rode Ronda Van Drenthe at the weekend. Was a do not did not finish, unfortunately. As she pointed out, though, fewer than 40 riders did actually finish that race. Um, represented Team GB at the World Championships last year. And another big talent. Uh, daughter of Lisa Brambani, as I mentioned earlier. And, and as I say, quite a contrast, because it seems that, that her mum isn't really all that involved in her career, Certainly 
certainly doesn't sound like a pushy mother in any way whatsoever, and that Abby May kind of got into the sport of her own volition. But just refer back to what we were saying earlier about how the younger members of a sporting family are determined to beat their older, and what we were talking about, siblings. Um, it was quite funny chatting to Abby May because she says her, her big driving force is to be better than her mum. Um, so she wants to do her time trials faster. She wants to win more titles than her, and that's her benchmark. So um, quite a nice thing to aim for, really. But it sounds like a very healthy relationship that they have. So I spoke to Abby May Parkinson. Here she is. When I was young, I kind of started off doing swimming. Like, there was nothing to do with the bike until quite later on. I was a swimmer, and then my school was really into running, so I kind of got into a bit of cross-country, and I did some triathlon. And it wasn't until I think I was maybe like a second year under 14 um, that from triathlon I kind of thought, oh, you know, I like, I like doing the bike. Um, and I kind of went along to, like, um, a bit of, like, a local club practice around Bradford and then um, met bumped into Mark Barry who both my parents kind of raced with um, and he was coaching so he kind of took me under his wing and helped me along and he's big into the track and I got brought along to Manchester Velodrome and that's kind of where I got picked up with British Cycling really. Well from doing triathlons really I had like this pink mountain bike that I absolutely, I, I don't know how I managed to ride around. And we used to, when we were young, like, we used to just, like, ride around the playing field. And I can remember, like, the earliest memory of doing this triathlon. I was, <laughs> did my swim, and then I got out the pool, and you put on, like, your tri belt with your number, and you put your trainers on and get on. And I'd finished this triathlon. And I tried so hard, I was like, I was sick. And I looked down and my trainers were on the wrong feet because I'd got all my belt up. <laughs> and that's kind of like my first kind of like sporting memory, really. Just like this pink mountain bike and this epic triathlon that I don't know how I managed to love doing that. But <laughs> it was important that I was doing sports. I was always a really sporty child. And I mean... When I was really young, like, I'd even be going to swim in before school and they'd be getting up at sort of, like, half past four to take me swimming early morning before school. Um, so, like, I do think that they loved me being in sport and it was kind of, like, what I enjoyed. I know that they wouldn't have wanted me to do something that I didn't like. And, I mean, like, when they finished cycling... Um, they had nothing to do with the sport until I then took it back up again. So there's quite a lot of cyclists whose kid rides now, like Jesse Walker, Chris, Chris Walker, um, and Ollie Wood and Alistair Wood. They all used to ride with us. And Lizzie Holden, who's my teammate now, um, Rob Holden, her dad, who my mum and dad used to race with. So they're kind of like interacting with all their old friends from cycling and it's like super different for them but especially my dad he's he's got really really back into the sport and when I was a junior he helped with some of the team um perspectives so like he's definitely fallen back in love with the sport but when my mum was riding there wasn't much support for women cycling especially in the UK and my mum started riding a bike quite late as well as retiring quite early so she moved to America to kind of get the support she needs um, and it's great now that I can have all the support and um, being in Europe and Europe is kind of like the place where we can sort of live and everything and British Cycling has developed so much for women's Psych for the women as well, so that it's a big difference to when my mum was riding. I definitely do want to be better than my mum. Like we are competitive in that way, uh, <laughs> and like even even when I was sort of like you know a few years ago when I was doing the ten mile time trials, she used she had like a list on on the um, medal of the times that she won 
like competitions with them on 10 mile time trial and it'll be sort of like oh I'm nearly beating you and then like I beat her and I'll be like oh yeah I'm so much better than you but but, um no it is like it is really really good and like especially when I did the Giro last year um sort of like just knowing that like, you've got so much support around you. And my mum used to race with a woman called Maria Blower, who really helped me at the Giro, actually, because she'd done the um, the women's Tour de France back, back when she was riding. So it was really good that I sort of had so much support and tips from, from when they were riding. She is like a really sort of tough Yorkshire girl is my mum and sort of like to never give up is the main thing, you know, like she would never DNF a race, you know, without giving her all and it was like the last sort of sort of thing that you could do. So like just never really give up, never like I would never be a soft rider, I'm quite like hard and I think I've definitely learnt that from my mum. I'd probably say, like, my mum is kind of tougher on me mentally, um, but that's kind of... I feel you need that to progress, and my dad's sort of, like, the soft one who will say it's all OK. So it is, like, a nice kind of a balance. Quite nice to um, hear from Abby May there talking about the parents who, uh, former riders themselves, who are now meeting up again through their kids at races. I like to think of them with their flasks of tea and their sandwiches wrapped in tin foil by the side of the road with the little deck chairs. It's probably nothing like that, but it's quite nice to, to hear that. Well, on that, on that note, Orla, um, I spoke at the Women's Tour last year to Chris Walker, whose daughter, Jessie Walker, who was mm. a teammate of Abby May Parkinson's last year in Italy, has has retired from the sport, sadly, although she's still involved. Maybe she'll return to racing at some point. Um, but I spoke to him. He was a, a top rider. His wife was also a top rider. So another cycling family. And Chris Walker had an interesting perspective, and his son is a, a, a bike rider as well. He had an interesting perspective on just how far women's cycling had come since his day. Jessie was saying that she'd obviously been cycling all her life, mountain biking her and her brother, and that when they both got into road cycling, you were cock-a-hoop delighted. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was a difficult thing because you don't want to feel, you know, like you're being a pushy parent. So we never really did push them into it. You know, we just let them enjoy the mountain biking, and you know, they were doing it from you know kids. So, uh, but like I say, never really pushed them into it, and they decided, you know, both of them decided they wanted to do it off their own bikes, which is the way it needed to be, really. How do you feel now with your daughter Jessie having? You know, the opportunity that perhaps didn't exist 20, 30 years ago for a, a young female rider to be a professional and to ride in races like this. Oh, it's absolutely brilliant. We were, we were looking at some uh, pictures the other day when my wife used to race for Great Britain, but she used to have to race as a junior with, with you know, with us in the same race as us, and, and they used to start them in, in front and there'd be probably two or three riders. And then since then, when we got back into it, we had a, a small small team uh, with youths and juniors and, and there was like 60, 60 riders under 16, 60 girls, you know, lining up. So it's absolutely amazing. And, and yesterday to, to see it on TV and the amount of support, but, I, you know, and the racing as well. The racing was, you know, brilliant racing, really. You could tell, you know, if you'd done it before, you could tell how, how grippy the race was. So the, the racing hard as well, which is brilliant. So that's a massive change, isn't it? The, you know, just maybe even not even the last 20, 30 years, but the last in the last decade. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So, to, I mean, you see the team setups here. It could be it could be a men's professional uh, race in town. Or you, you've got the same setup with the team buses, the all the cars. It, it's just it's unbelievable. So that was Chris Walker himself, a former top rider and the father of uh, of Jesse Walker. Um, it is cycling is a real family sport isn't it it's it's it does tend to be passed down through the generations i, I wonder why that is it's, it's uh particularly in places like belgium you know the, the their whole cycling family dynasties there the plankerts and others i think it's because it's such a family friendly sport to do anyway it's the kind of thing that even if you're not a professional cyclist if you're into riding in any way whatsoever you'll want to go out with your kids won't you it's a lovely way to spend time with them i mean i know i'd i'd love my daughter to come out riding with me so i think as well whenever the kids see that there is 
a potential career in that, which, which most kids when they're out riding their bikes would just think it's for fun. If you see that there might be a career path in that, then you're maybe more likely to go into it as well. But I think it probably comes from just it being quite a, a wholesome family activity at its very core. You were mentioning another cycling family, Steve. Yes, the Barkers, so who, who I do know. <laughs> well, uh, because they're well. Welsh, aren't they? <laughs> well, cyclists. So, well, I know, El- I know Eleanor. I don't know, um, I, I, I don't know Megan. But he doesn't I mean, know all the Welsh, right? No, absolutely. We've established but that. Th- 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 there's, another, uh, there's another fantastic sort of c- cycling family built around that South Wales, South Wales Hotspot. Megan, obviously, Olim- uh, sorry, Eleanor, obviously, an Olympic champion from, fr- fr- from Rio. And uh, I think Megan is on the GB Academy now, or... Certainly, the Olympic Development Program. Not entirely sure, um, and I know sort of some, some great things expected of, of her, and I think Eleanor as well, who will just continue to, she's still very young and still continue to to develop. I think she's got some some goals on the road in terms of time trial, which would be exciting to exciting to see, as well as probably continuing through to uh, Tokyo 2020. The Barn Sisters, the Garner mm-hmm, Sisters. Mm-hmm. There's there's so many of them. There's aren't loads there? of them. It's amazing. Yeah. It's interesting though, isn't it? That going back to what Orla was saying in terms of it seems to be like this this family dynasty and you you sort of wonder why that is and I guess it is because you see parents and siblings doing things and you you aspire to do them Mm. and that's how the sort of it almost propagates for for the sport wouldn't it be great though if we were in a position where because the superstars of the sport were so visible on television (laughs) that actually lots of young women and young girls actually were able to see the sport and say I want to be like that. And that's how we then created the next generation of cyclists rather than necessarily just having to be passed down from family to family. I think that is starting to happen. And it's, I seem to speak about it in every episode, but there is that balance to be had between um, momentum and patience. And I do think these days, we, right now, in the last couple of years, certainly, we have seen, even if they are more track cyclists than um, road cyclists, and I'm talking very specifically about here in the UK, so apologies to international listeners, but we, Laura Trott is a household name. Vicky Pendleton is a household name. Lizzie Dagnan, maybe to a lesser extent, because because she's rude, but we we are starting to see that, and that is going to happen a little bit more, I think. Dare, dare we be optimistic and hopeful? Is that come, just I, me? Come on, come I, on, I think I think you're right, but have you spotted that I'm a little impatient? <laughs> And why not? Why not? Let's leave it on that optimistic note this month, shall we? We'll be back uh, next month. Not sure what we've got planned for that, but I think you're going to be going out to one of these inaugural women's... Are you going to Liege by Son Liege? I'm not sure which one I'm going to go to yet, but I'm going to go to one of the Arden. That would be great. Looking forward to that. And uh, we also this year will have a... As the Cycling Podcast, we produce 11 friends specials throughout the year. You can become a friend of the podcast at thecyclingpodcast.com. I think we've released, uh, well, by the time this goes out, we might be on to our second friend special of the year. Lionel's doing, Lionel Bernie's doing a series of, of podcasts from uh, Flanders. Um, and the, the one after that will be Matt Heyman talking through his win at 2016 Pyre Roubaix. Um, you can become a friend of the podcast at thecyclingpodcast.com for £10. But one of our friend specials this year will be on women's racing. It will be most likely a rider diary, a bit like the Joe Dombrowski diary that we did at the Giro last year. Um, details, not least the identity of the rider, will be <laughs> confirmed very soon. And the race could be the Tour of California. Watch, <gasps> watch the space. Excellent. Anyway, that's exciting. Um, in the meantime, that's all for this month. So thank you very much, Orla. Thank you very much. And thanks for coming to join us, Steve. Thanks very much, Richard. You are listening to the cycling podcast Femina, supported by Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004.